any donations that you leave in the box at the back end will be given to the Wet'suwet'en to advance the work that they're trying to do to protect their land. So I am delighted to have Chief Smogethkam here tonight. Denise, is that you? Taka, is that you? Sky, is that you? My name is Smogethkam. I am a hereditary chief of the Sun House of the Laksamusu clan of the Wet'suwet'en Nation. Not the Wet'suwet'en First Nation, it's the Wet'suwet'en Nation. Uh, I, have to make a, I have to make that really explicit because there is a Wet'suwet'en First Nation and it's a band. And it's a band, it's an elected band system that has actually signed deals with pipeline companies. We are the Wet'suwet'en Nation, not the Wet'suwet'en First Nation. So if you're doing a report or if you're writing an article or you're gonna write about this later, make that distinction very clear. I hold a hereditary chief name that, um, that has been around for thousands of years. And it's a rich history. It's a rich history that is kind of explained a bit more in our people moving through the lands that a lot of people call Northern BC. I lived in a place called Unistoten Camp for eight years. And um, for one year, I stayed there by myself with a small group of supporters while many of the Unistota and went about their lives. I lived out there and took care of the place, and we kept pipeline workers out of there. I think it was November 24th. My mother was in home palliative care. She was, she was dying. And I chose to spend all my time with her since October 5th when my family first found out about her, her health. <clears throat> As many of you understand, losing parents that are really close to you, it's one of the most difficult parts of your life. But on November 24th, I was by her bedside, taking care of her, feeding her, bringing her water, giving her the medication that she needed to make it through. She was dealing with kidney failure. And we got a knock on the door at my mom's house. And it was, um, it was a guy delivering a notice of claim from the Coastal Gassing Pipeline Project. They delivered it to my mom, to my dying mother's house. And they served me with a notice that I was going to be taken to court and held responsible for billions of dollars of loss from the Coastal Gassing Pipeline Project. And also a notice of claim stating that they were going to be applying for an in, a permanent injunction against us. On December 14th of last year, we made it into court. I think I had about um, two and a half weeks. No, it was less than two weeks from when I actually found a lawyer until we were sitting in court. Um, meanwhile, the Coastal Gassing Pipeline Company was, they, they showed up to court, they had five binders. They're accompanied by the legal representative for the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. They had government officials sitting with them, former government officials sitting with them. All of my fellow head chiefs showed up. We weren't allowed to wear our regalia in the courtroom, but we sat in the front and made it really obvious that we were there. And we listened to our lawyer give it his best shot in the less than two weeks that he had to prepare for that case. And as expected, the, as many of you have heard, the court injunction was granted against our people. And a pipeline company was cheering. They're excited. They left the courtroom really excited, hugging each other. And the chiefs of the Wet'suwet'en Nation walked out of the courtroom and 
dismay and disgust, but also with the expected results that we saw come out of that. Uh, we plan on doing a fall construction camp, and this is the exciting part. Uh, we want to build a climate change research center. As David Suzuki said, we can't, we can't put a big enough explanation mark on the urgency of doing something like this. But we can't let colonization lead us through that process. In order for us to make any difference in the climate change that's happening, it's kicking down our front door right now, we need to make sure that we have indigenous people, indigenous decision makers taking that lead. We have to do that. We're the ones that are taking the biggest risks right now. We're the ones taking the biggest risks. Why? Because we have a solid connection to those territories. When people ask me, well, what connection do you have to those territories? What I've been telling them is, you can dig anywhere in North America. Dig down as deep as you can go. You're gonna find genetic evidence of the people who've been here for thousands of years because we've been here so long. We've been here so long. We know that inherently as indigenous people, we can feel it. That's why we have so many powerful ceremonies. Some people might not really understand the ceremonies. They might think it's like an abstract idea, but to us it's physical. It's purely physical and spiritual. So um, this is Parrot Lake. This is where we're gonna build our cabin and our climate change research center. My uncle, Zahail, the guy that was in a previous photo with me, um, he's a general contractor by trade and he's retired. He retired uh, two years ago, but he's coming out of retirement. He's, a, he's, um, he's an old warrior from the Delgamuk days when our people took the Canadian government to court. We were the plaintiffs and we fought them in court. We went right to the Supreme Court of Canada. There are blockades all over Gitsan and Wet'suwet'en territory. My uncle is the one who orchestrated all of those. And the work that I was doing woke that part of him up. And when I went back to my people and I stopped working for the Unistotem people and volunteering for them, he was one of the first ones to approach me and say, we have to do something. All the work that you've been doing all these years inspired me to do something. I mean, I'm not gonna do it by myself but I'm gonna help you. So that's what we're gonna be doing now. We're here for the long run, we're not going anywhere. Our people have been here for thousands of years. Uh, we've survived so many things from colonization and we're gonna survive this as well. And we're gonna win, we know it. Say <laughs> The Dalgamuk Stayway court case, the Kala court case, which I am the house chief of, and also the Nikal case, all those cases we won. And through that, those three, we told the world who we are, how we looked after our land, and who are the true caretakers of the land. And yet, the governments and industry are still dancing around that. This is our dairy right here. 
Tell bridge qua. Provincial and federal officials and all elected officials only have assumed and presumed authority over the Wet'suwet'en territory. The territory, the Yinta, the land, the air, the water, that all belongs to the Wet'suwet'en people. We've never ceded nor surrendered nor signed a treaty to give away any of that authority to anybody. So if there are decisions to be made on our land, it is our decision and nobody else's. My parents, my grandparents told me when I was very young, they say, don't ever let anybody pull the wool over your eyes when you when you get older. I said, we never signed nothing. This land is still yours to protect. And that's the way I've looked at it all my life. There's no such thing as Crown land in my books because we never signed the land to nobody. Uh, it still belongs to us, the First Nation. You know, the province of uh, British Columbia and uh, the federal government they talk about reconciliation. When they talk about reconciliation, and they undermine their own words by trying to shove pipelines down our throat or industry down our throat, and it's just not the way we do business. There will be no pipeline to enter with Odin territory. The decision-making powers for our traditional territories lie with us, the hereditary chiefs. We've gone to the highest courts of Canada to prove our title and our responsibilities and our ability to be the authority of these territories. The provinces and the federal government have decided that they don't want to deal with us, that they would rather go to people who are willing to say yes to them. And we're sick and tired of that. We have to stand up for our traditional territories. We have to make sure that we are the ones that make the decisions on them. If we say no to any kind of development because it would impede on our ability to take care of our future generations, then that's going to be the answer. The authority of a, a hereditary chief comes uh, exactly that, through the hereditary system. It's not by election. It's, uh, it's by consensus of the clan members. That, uh, that put you into this position. The position takes us into speaking in the feast hall with authority, with the, all of the clan members and your clan in mind, and uh, a, a total trust that we're uh, acting on the best behalf of our clan and our nation. We have to think about the land, we have to think about the water, we think about the uh, air, the animals, and uh, a lot of the authority that we have is that, uh, that we make sure that uh, there's an abundance of ways that we can live off the, off the land. And uh, today it's being threatened, and a uh, majority of our people are, are not agreeing with the, the fact that the gas and the gas pipeline um, is a good thing for our Wet'suwet'en people. decided to build this healing center to bring our own people out here and bring healing to them spiritually, mentally, physically and use this space to make our people strong like the residential schools were used to take the Indian out of the child we want to use this facility to put the Indian back in our children meaning our culture if our people have our culture they'll be strong and they'll be able to stand on their own two feet and we'll have a strong nation to 
learn to take care of ourselves and take care of our resources, take care of the land. If we take care of our land, then the land will take care of us. It's an opportunity for us to use our values and our teachings um, and our conceptions of wellness and how to achieve that to support our community members. And the Western system does an inadequate job. We're overrepresented as Indigenous people, as children, um, as adults, in, in the correctional systems with mental health uh, disorders, with uh, higher rates of suicidal ideation and behavior. We're at risk because of those legacies of colonization and that disconnect from who we are as Indigenous people. I think one of the most powerful things um, about the potential with this, this center is that we can design the programming from an Indigenous perspective on what wellness is. We don't have many spaces that are our own for healing as Indigenous people. a lot of incentives for our communities to, to look at these in industry partnerships for things like LNG or tar sands. It comes at a huge cost and it's a cultural cost. It's an identity cost essentially. It's asking communities who are at a disadvantage really to sign on for short-term opportunities um, to feed their children without allowing them to consider the impacts on their grandchildren and the next generations to, to really have those opportunities to embrace their identity and who they are because so much of that for us is based on our, our land and our connection to the land and all the teachings. In short, I would see uh, those projects, especially the ones proposed to run through this territory as, as a threat to us reclaiming and self-determining our own health and wellness. We as Indigenous people are the ones that are have always protected our lands from time memorial and we're the ones that are stepping up. We've been living here for about 10 years. We've been here protecting the territory from unwanted projects like Coastal Gas Link. Various different pipeline companies trying to come in and been ensuring that the only people that get in here are the ones that have consent of my clan. And for the last probably five years, we've had companies trying to force their way in or bring in workers via chopper and land at the back of the territory. We ended up setting up a satellite camp so people were actually camping out there and just watching for activity and radioing us whenever any choppers or anything tried to land back there. For safety reasons, we decided we wanted to put a mobile tiny home that we can transport wherever it's needed. We're hoping to have it all finished before the summer and before the Pipeline companies tried to come in again. We're hoping to have it all set up and ready to go at the back of the territory. So, to us, the LNG terminal they're trying to put into Kitimat is not safe and it's not healthy for the salmon and for the waters and for us it would impact a lot of the remaining territories that we do have and that we still use like we use this territories for berry picking our medicines and it's an important spawning channel that we're trying to protect because uh, we're salmon people and we rely on the salmon for our food source so well, everything you depend on depends on water and if people don't start protecting these water sources then 
all of us will be in trouble as a humankind. So people need to educate themselves and do what you can to make that change, to protect our waters, protect the air, protect the land. Because it's not just about us, it's, it's about everybody. Some of guys always come and interrupt our prayers, our eating. And it's good to climb up. Hey, good morning. What's up? We have a complaint that there was a box on the bridge. I didn't see no box. It's the box right there that was painted black. And the young girl at 8.30 came this morning and removed it. She just said it had kindling in there. Maybe somebody forgot it when we were doing ceremony last night. Okay. Because we got complaints that there was lots of activity on the bridge last night. Ceremony. Look at the flags. We did a water ceremony because they're trying okay. to destroy our water. Yeah. I'm just getting annoyed of their okay. bullshit tactics. They're making us, trying to make us look bad and send you guys all the time. And every time they do stuff to us, it takes you guys two hours to get here. So you're blessing the water last night on the bridge? Or? We're doing prayers for the water because it's okay. in danger right now because of this BS that's happening right now. It's not just this, they destroyed our traps, destroyed our trap line. Conservation wouldn't come till they already cleared. All of this adds up and you got to understand our frustration. We've been here since time immemorial before anybody came to these lands and your law can bend the rules to let somebody come in and destroy our land. And you get you guys to help them. If it was your house, you'd feel the same if the same vandals keep coming and wrecking your shit and nobody's doing anything. I was here 10 years and it took a long time to put this stuff up. They're here one week and they want to destroy it all. Nowhere in injunction does it tell them they can freaking ruin my stuff. I'm pissed. What's in one time in front of your face. Thinking of what are some of the, the challenges and also positive things that have come out of the last year. Well, in the last year, it's been busy. up not just indigenous people everybody needs to stand up to the political powers that be that they need to change and quit making legislation and policies to make us look like criminals when we're just trying to protect what is ours it's not just this little courthouse the whole world is watching what Canada is doing what the province of BC is doing they haven't done their job they're skirting the responsibility over to industry and I know I'm doing the right thing Good to see some more with Yeah. <laughs> no, we're fine. Okay. There you go. Yeah. And they were building. Yeah. They were building all of it. Oh boy, yeah. that's sad. <laughs> There's some bannock there and some moose heart and uh, chili on the stove. Hey, I didn't even know you were There's here. There's a plate if you like.
great. And do Esla. I'm sorry, I don't understand. Get him then, Bianca. My name is Vic, and I'm with the Coastal Gasoline Project. And the reason for Mr. Couture to be here is yeah. to post the injunction that was granted by the BC Supreme Court mm -hmm. to allow us access to do the work. Canadian uh, courts do not have any jurisdiction on Wet'suwet'en territories. The Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs have full jurisdiction. We have for thousands of years since time immemorial. We have never ceded or surrendered any of that jurisdiction. So I am not here to argue that point with you. So, so um, we're going to post the injunction. You're not going to allow us through to get to the bridge. Um, with what what uh, access we have or what... Uh... I have nothing stopping you from accessing the bridge. On the other side of the bridge is a different territory. This is Gidimden territory. You're trespassing on the third of Remove us forcibly from our lands with your rifles, with your semi-automatic weapons. Nothing has changed in 150 years. keeping our eyes on the planned demonstrations across the country, all in support of anti-pipeline protesters in British Columbia. 14 people were arrested at the protest site late yesterday. That sparked a stand of solidarity across the country. Rallies were staged in dozens of cities, even some in the U.S., in support of the anti-pipeline protesters. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau could face heat over the issue tonight. He's in Kamloops, B.C., hosting a town hall. Trudeau has made improved relations with Indigenous people a core priority of his government. Um, you in the striped scarf. Yes. Hello, my name is Tilly. I come from the Statlium Nation. I want to ask you, what are you going to do to stop oppressing and holding our people under um, your, your colonization. When are you going to give us our rights back? When are you going to start giving a shit about who we are as people and not seeing us just for our land? I believe that the conflict that you're making it into out west with helicopters flying overhead and, and paramilitaries showing up with assault rifles is uh, appalling. And so I'm more or less here to tell you that that's shameful. What you did to the Unistoten, that's a national disgrace. Shame. January 7th was a, was a national disgrace of Canada. It's inspiring to see the support worldwide that we have. And it's not just our Indigenous people that are standing up, it's people all around the world are concerned about the environment and concerned because they know it impacts them no matter where they live. So yeah, with that injunction and such low numbers out here, all of the Wet'suwet'en chiefs, because of what happened at 44, were afraid for us that were still up here at the camp and they didn't want any of us to get hurt. So out of fear, they made their decision to get us to stand back and we made a decision that we not, it was too demoralizing that we weren't going to take down those gates. If they wanted them down, they had to do it. This is my people's land way before the settlers came here. And you think you have a right to come on our land and destroy it. It's not right. My people have history here. The partners that have signed, they have no history here. And I hope you can go home and sleep tonight. 
started coming back here in 2009 when we wanted to put a cabin here and realized that we safely could drink this water. So this became our prime point on where we wanted to spend more of our time. This is the proposed corridor for multiple pipelines and we decided to move out here because we realized we couldn't protect our territories from afar were two hours away and because they kept on trying to come in. Who are you? My name is Rod. Where are you I'm, from? I'm with Chevron, representing the Pacific Trail Pipeline Project. We're here today because we'd like to do work on the territory and we're requesting access to the territory here today so that Wet'suwet'en people can work and see the benefits from our project. We've already said no to these projects and that no pipelines will come on our territory. And we only have two territories left out of all our territories because of other people occupying our lands and agriculture, municipalities. All we have left is two areas and this is one of them. We hunt, we fish, we trap. This is our critical infrastructure. So what you're telling us is that you will not allow us access onto the territory. We understand that. We thank you for your time here today. We the brought you an offering. Again? We've left some water, some um, tobacco. No, we thanks. Believe. We've got clean water right there. That's what we drink. And that's pollution, the plastic that adds to the landfill. The fifth meeting of the 18th session of the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues is called to order. I am Frida Hewson of the Unistatan, Wet'suwet'en people of Canada. I am here today to express concerns for human rights violations happening to my people. This year, a pipeline company forced a court injunction on us, and if we stop them from entering our territory because they don't have consent, we face arrests. We have not been able to hunt or gather our traditional foods. The company has security and police force for keeping us from exercising our Indigenous rights. Elders, women, and healing center clients have been threatened with arrest for accessing our own territory. The pipeline company is violating Wet'suwet'en law, trespassing on our territory and starting to destroy the land. They have already destroyed the heritage site. After bulldozing part of the forest, we searched through the piles of dirts for evidence of my people. We found artifacts. The archeology span branch of the government and police assistants came in and took the artifacts and then released news bulletins claiming the artifacts were not from their original place. They are trying to erase us from our own land. All these acts that continue are the acts of genocide. I am here today to make a UN aware of our continuous genocide happening in Canada and to demand that our indigenous rights and laws are respected. We're wondering why our own people weren't standing up beside us and the more and more we realize that a lot of my family, the ones that are standing up, all the females in my family, we've done a lot of healings in our lives. We've gone through the same trauma as everybody else on our reservations. So that's the reason why we're able to stand up and stand up against what we know is wrong. So that's why we identified that other people aren't able to stand up because they're still stuck in their trauma and oppression and everything that comes with being oppressed and living in a system that discriminates against you. So when my niece started going to school for clinical psychology, her long-term vision was to see a healing center on the land so that we can start healing our people. It took us four years to build the three phases of our healing center, which has a commercial kitchen, dining hall was built in the first phase, and then a rec room upstairs and food storage. And then the second phase included a boardroom a uh, laundry room, an office, and two counseling spaces, and the third floor was a uh, art room slash uh, workshop room. So that was the second phase that was put in, and then the third phase was sleeping quarters. So this is the fourth year of work camp, and it's pretty much done with just minor, small, minor things.
And then now the long-term goal is to add more cabins because for the healing center, we require a whole territory, all of Talbitzqua, to make this program successful. This is a new cabin being constructed by one of another significant site for our people. And this is the second one we're building to reoccupy another part of the territory. It's beautiful scenery, tons and tons of medicine in this area. My dad always told me that the only way we're not going to lose all our traditional territories, we have to reoccupy them. It's pretty much what settler people have done. They occupied our territories and now they call those municipalities and act like they own it even though it's still with Sudan lands. But he said we needed to reoccupy and behave like we own it because we do own it. We're behaving like we own these lands and we don't need nobody's permission to put up our cabins and we don't need nobody's permission to be here. We only go by our own with Sudan laws. What do you think is going to happen in the future in this land? The future I see is more and more of our people living in cabins all over this territory, more of our people getting thoroughly immersed in their culture, becoming independent and harvesting their own food, their own medicine, so they can take care of themselves and their families. More and more other clans doing the same of what we're doing on their territories. The future I see is there will be no pipelines through here. The future I see, there will be no man camp here. What are you afraid of? That's a trick question because I don't fear anything. government's uh, philosophy is the greater good for all, you know, and uh, in this case it's not the greater good for all, it's the greater good for these oil cartels, that's all. My name is uh, Adam Gagnon, my respected chief name is Zahel. Zahel, in English translation, is uh, the wake of a whale. Well, historically this has been a village. You know, when all of the colonization was at its max there after the First World War, what ended up happening there is the government uh, started a big campaign to try to move all of the uh, First Nations off their homelands and move them all onto reserves. The site that we're on, you know, uh, it used to home at least four of our uh, ancestral home sites. And uh, now we're looking at reoccupying it and uh, rebuilding the village there that got destroyed. fight on the land uh, by Unastotan and the Gidimdan and uh, Laksamasu are, uh, are really important. Canada has just trying to been squashing us and squashing us for the last 150 years, you know, and uh, we're still here and the pushback is going to keep on happening. All of us uh, were working, you know, at uh, developing this community and it's not, uh, it's not a camp, it was historically a community and that's what it's going to be in the future and it's going to be a, uh, a permanent village site. And like I said, we're encouraging non-Aboriginal people there that are concerned about the environment to join the medicine show and build out here and live in harmony with the Wet'suwet'en. I think it's really important there that uh, uh, all of you people out there that uh, want to be a part of this um, medicine show and climate fight to try to make contributions there directly onto our site of Luxamasu. Uh, where we have links 
you know, to uh, funding, and we have a GoFundMe as well as um, you know other sources of income that's coming in through email, e-transfers, and whatnot. So these are things that we're looking for. And uh, and if you know any foundations there that you get access funds for to help uh, help us out there for uh, building our community as well as uh, the Climate Research Center and uh, the legal. Uh, war chest I think it's going to be really important there that um, everybody join the medicine show and we all work together. It's our sovereign right to be on our lands. You know before colonization we had a lot of people coming in to try and take over our territories and we fought them. You know this isn't a new war this is a war that is just another war that we're going to have to protect our lands. My name is Smogoth Gem. I'm the predator chief of the Sun House of the Fireweed Clan in the Wet'suwet'en Nation. We're uh, at Parrot Lake. It's a site where our people had an ancient village. And um, around 1905 and 1908, our people were forced off of our lands. Uh, their tactics haven't changed. They're still confronting our people at gunpoint. You look at what happened on January 7th out in Gidimden Access Point. The, in the following days up in Unistoten camp, when the RCMP came in, forcing our people off of our lands at gunpoint. They've been working in earnest to try and silence us, to stop us so that colonization can still continue its destructive path. The, the pipeline project that wants to go through here is just a bit north of the site here, and um, they plan on building it this winter. We've never been consulted. Our clan has already made our position really clear. There will be no pipelines coming through our territories. And if you made consultation efforts with other people and made financial deals with them, that's your loss, not ours. Typically, if uh, anybody wants to do anything on our territories, what they need to do is consult with the clan, and the clan will talk about it. All the matriarchs, the clan members, will all be involved in that discussion, along with the wing chiefs and the elders, and we'll all sit down and we'll discuss what it is people want to talk with us about. If they want to do anything on any of our territories, they would have to sit down with us and tell us what their proposed idea is, and we would have a discussion, and we'd decide if we were going to let them come out and do it or not, and if it was going to benefit our people, how would it benefit us, or if it would be detrimental to the future of our people, that was something else that we'd take into consideration. He was, he was super fun. When my client decided to move up here, one of the things we did was do a grassroots initiative and a grassroots call out to people to come out and help us on the site. And quite a few different crews have showed up since the spring to help us with the three cabins that we have. And um, we're asking for more people to come out. People with construction skills or people who are just physically capable and they know they can do it and want to learn. They, they're welcome to come out and work with some of the experienced people to learn how to do all the construction stuff on site. Since the hail confronted uh, Coastal Gas Link in the community hall in Watset, we've received an incredible amount of support from people from all over, all over the world. But uh, people are really interested in coming out and doing something here and working with the hail and our clan to reestablish this village site and let the world know that the Watsutan are not gone. The Watsutan are not going to back down. We are in the process of reoccupying our lands and taking over the sites that our ancestors occupied before, before colonization came here. And uh, we need everybody's help. Just to hear more. That looks good, right there. And kind of pull, and then pull your wrist towards you, and that fills the bucket up. A lot of settlers out there are struggling with their ideas around what reconciliation looks like. Reconciliation to Western society doesn't mean much. Reconciliation to the indigenous people who have lived here for thousands of years and are struggling with the oppressive regime that opposes itself here is what we need to listen to. We need to listen to the indigenous people and find out what reconciliation means to them. How can we make it happen? We can find ways to assist the people 
been moving back onto their ancestral land so that they can enjoy the spaces that their ancestors have. We need help. We need people who are capable of fundraising. We need people who are capable of just coordinating work groups of volunteers. We need people who can assist people from their community to travel out here to assist us. Anything that you can do to help us would be greatly appreciated. But uh, right now, I think what we're really looking for are people with helping hands. Every single one of the band councils were told that this pipeline is going through anyway. You guys could either take the money or walk away with nothing. And they bought into it. And uh, the hereditary chiefs there, the Wet'suwet'en, decided, you know, that uh, we are not, you know, going to condemn the band councils for you know, buying into these uh, tactics that were thrown in front of them by CGL and government. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's up to us, you know, to try to educate them that we have to take, you know, a stand, you know, for the betterment of the territory and for uh, the people on our territory that share it with us. Mm -hmm. You think oil and gas is going to stay cheap in Canada once everything is being shipped abroad? <laughs> Not likely. You know, that's all part of the fair market clause. Things are going to just change. Mm -hmm. And you look at the Alberta government giving permits now to triple the size of tar sands. You look at a 48 inch pipe, is that going to be hauling, you know, uh, fracked gas? You know, you're looking at, uh, you know, this uh, moratorium on tankers. We're two years into it, eight year moratorium. They figure this project is going to be finished in five more years. Right when the moratorium is over, what are they going to be moving through the pipe? It's built the same wall for bitumen, same as what Embridge had. So they're painting it green, your color. <laughs> yeah. So you know. So what's happened here? You know, it's deception at its greatest level from the highest level of government. And what they're doing is they're paving the way, you know, for this industry to just run rampant right over all of the indigenous people. They're undermining the whole Delgamuk Stayway court case by doing this, you know, and uh, nobody is doing anything. Right now, the country is starting to rise up and starting to take note. I really appreciate you coming out and being a part of us. I can't even, I'm, I'll just say I've got, uh, it's something that I've talked quite a bit since getting elected, uh, is how we're still acting like a resource colony. Yeah. That, that the way that it was when uh, James Douglas and those boats showed up on the south coast of uh, Vancouver Island, um, and ran into my uh, ancestors, the St. Nuch people, uh, that same mentality of this is all this is here for someone else's benefit to enjoy. Yeah. And it's our job to remove it as quickly as possible uh, for as little as possible and, and you know, with as little pain as possible, hopefully. Yeah. That's still, that, that really is still the mentality that we face. Yeah. Uh, when we're when we're dealing with um, resource extraction and resource development, and really, if we're going to uh, have dignity and if we are going to protect the integrity of this place, as your ancestors and my ancestors down south and the ancestors of Indigenous people across the the province and across the country, the landscape have done, um, we're going to have to fundamentally change the the mindset. We're going to have to fundamentally change the economic equation. Appreciate your words there because, uh, you know, our elders, you know, back in the 70s were saying, you know, that we tried making deals with government back then. We tried to say co-management and uh, we said that the destruction of our lands is unacceptable because we should not be raping the land. We should be nurturing the land. Thank you for yep. me up here. <laughs> it's, it's cold, cold man. <laughs> it is. <laughs>